Hi, my name is Dave Adams. Welcome to The Core Mechanic. And today we're looking at the very abstract, incredibly logical, and somewhat puzzling game, Mastermind. It's number 15 on Mike Selinker's list of 100 games you absolutely, positively must know how to play. So let's check it out. Hi, my name's Dave Adams, and I love playing games. At the 2015 PAX convention, one of my favourite game designers, Mike Selinker, presented his list of top 100 games you must absolutely, positively know how to play. The 100th game on the list was a challenge to play a game of my own design. With a desire to understand more about the hobby that I love so much, I've taken on that challenge to design a game. But first, I need to learn as much as I can about game design. I'm going to start by playing as many of the games on Mike's list as possible. Join me as I learn more about the core mechanic. Mastermind is a two-player deductive and logic reasoning game based around the theme of code breaking. It was created in 1971 by Mordecai Merowitz, who was an Israeli postmaster and telecommunications expert. He struggled to sell the game, but eventually sold it at the Nuremberg Toy Show to Invicta Plastics, a UK-based production company. They have since passed on the rights of production to Hasbro. The game has sold over 50 million copies in 80 different countries and was even nominated for the Toy of the Century Award, despite the fact that it didn't win. The game is played between two players, one of which takes on the role of the mastermind. The mastermind's job is to create a code using a combination of pegs comprised of six different colors, though the colors can be repeated. The second player must crack the code by placing six pegs in any given order. The mastermind provides feedback on the code by placing black pins and white pins on the board next to the current code. Black indicates a correct color in the correct spot, and white pins indicate the correct color in a wrong spot, and of course no pins means that there are some that are wrong. The player must crack the code within 10 turns to win the game. It's believed that Mastermind was based on an older game called Bulls and Cows. No one really knows who created that or when it was created, but it was simply a pen and paper game in which the Mastermind would choose a four-digit number. The other player would have to try and guess the four-digit number, and if they got the correct number in the correct spot, the Mastermind would say Bull. And if they got the incorrect number in an incorrect spot, they would say Cow. So it was essentially based on the same mechanics. This was later developed by an MIT professor, J.M. Grocho, who I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his name 100% correct, so I'll put it at the bottom. But in 1970, he designed this as a computer game, which was one of the very early creations of computer games around. This was then later developed into Mastermind in 1971. Now, although Bulls and Cows uses only four digits, it's significantly more options and combinations than the Mastermind version. Simply because in Mastermind you've only got six colors to choose from and in all those six colors can repeat, you've only got 1,296 possible combinations. With the four digits, instead of six colors, you've got nine possibilities to choose from, which increases the number of combinations exponentially. So there's balances. And in Mastermind, you can actually alter uh, the rules to increase probability or decrease the, the different combinations required for solving the problem. The mechanics of Mastermind require players to internalize scientific reasoning. To play the game, you need to be able to think abstractly and using logic, to perform experiments, receive information from the Mastermind, and using that information refine and test that data to perform new experiments. Now, as I stated earlier, the game as it is, keeping the rules the same, requires you to work through 1,296 combinations and eliminating 1,295 of them to come to the correct answer within 10 guesses. Because of this logic and reasoning, the game has become widely accepted within the scientific and mathematical circles and highly regarded by those professions for its ability to teach these methods and to create ways of thinking and to help young people learn how to think differently and to think well when looking through experimentation as well as using logic for creating good deduction. 
Now, there's multiple strategies, all of which I can't go into simply because I don't even understand them all. And some of them work on really high planes, but these mathematicians and scientists spent a lot of time working out the maths behind it all and coming up with really elaborate theories on how to problem solve the game. In fact, two mathematicians who create formulas which I essentially consider to be magic and witchcraft uh, believe that the perfect player would need 4.340 guesses on average to win. I don't know how they come to that. Now, it's not just high-level mathematical formulas that the game is good at teaching. On a more basic level, the game teaches people how to find the unknown by using whatever little information they do have. And sometimes that even means beginning with guessing. And guessing can become a good part of the game, especially when you get to the end and there's still several options left. A good key skill for young people to learn for when doing standardized testing or even experimenting out in the real world under high pressure situations is learning how to make educated guesses or learning how to take risks with the information you have so that you're not just randomly going out and making guesses, that you're actually using the information you still have and putting out the best possible guess you can. It's hard to explain why that's so valuable except to say that it's something we do as a natural part of our everyday that probably isn't really noted by too many people, except that it is noted a lot of the time in military situations, in engineering situations, in even the maths and sciences when working in labs. So it does have benefit for those things, but it also helps people to use mistakes as a way of gathering new information. Every time you get something wrong in this game, you're actually still learning new things. And so players are able to take positive information of the black dots or the white dots and negative information of empty spaces and to use that to formulate more theories and to come to new experimentations that allow for greater growth and knowledge. So on, even on this very level, the game is significantly important for helping people to grow, not just logically, but in the way they think and to stretch their thinking and to be more bold in their thinking. The game is not my favorite game. And playing it as an adult, I've only really played it against AI, and perhaps that's part of the problem. I think this game really requires two human players, unless you're using some sort of amazing AI program such as the one that recently started beating world champions in the game Go and Chess, I think the human player is best. The human player can start to pick up on patterns that the player uses for trying to outthink the mastermind. And the mastermind's able to adapt their coding to the player so that they can try and take, take, make use of their weaknesses and turn that against them and force the player to think in new and fresh ways again. Whereas an AI will generally just randomly assign a code without too much concern for the strategies that the player is employing. So although I would still encourage two human players, it's a game that keeps people engaged for sure. And it's a game that has very little downtime because both players are engaged at all times. So that's definitely a plus. Thematically, it's just code breaking. Uh, it's more of a simulation rather than any sort of great theming. You don't feel a part of anything, but you're just trying to outthink an opponent. It's an abstract game. And I think the thing to remember is that for Mike Selinker, he's a puzzle guy. I mean, he's right in there with the puzzle books. He thinks that way. He thinks mathematically and logically. He loves using that in his games, even though he's a master at adapting that abstract mechanics with good theme and story. And I think he brings that balance really well. But still at the heart of it, he loves those abstract games. In fact, he's a word crossword puzzle master. I don't know if they have proper terms, but he's good at it anyway. For me as a teacher, I just like the game for what it brings to the way of thinking and helping young people to learn and to grow in different ways. But casually as an abstract game, it's good to just pull out and have a game if you've got the chance. It's not my cup of tea, but it's certainly a good game. It's certainly an important game, and I think I can understand why it's on Mike's list. As a game designer, I think the challenge for me is to bring into my games that sense of learning, 
Now, although traditionally games that have been built purposely for learning have failed or done poorly, that doesn't mean games aren't places for learning. In fact, Ralph Costa believes that in, in board games, in any game, it's the learning that's the drug because any game requires us to problem solve. Games require us to learn new things and to adapt and to strategize and to plan. And without learning, games become dull and meaningless and devoid of fun. So for Ralph Costa, the fun is essential part, but to have that fun, you must have that learning. And so for me, uh, trying to design a game right now, I'm trying to think through, well, what are my players learning? What do they take away from this game? How does this game shape or change the way they think or get them to think in new and creative ways? That's challenging, but it's doable. And it's one of the things I enjoy about games as well is learning to think differently. Well, thank you for listening. I love sharing Mastermind with you. I look forward to hearing from you, maybe if Mastermind has brought back some good memories or if you have a favorite abstract game that you want to share, please put it in the comments below. My name's Dave Adams. You've been watching The Core Mechanic. Until next time, have a great one.